Hello, everybody. Uh, I call this basic neurophysiology, brainwaves origin and function. It has been long awaited, at least from my side. That's why I did my best uh, to collect what I think is relevant information that should fill in the gaps in uh, our uh, practitioners training, whoever did train with Judith. But even if you are self-trainer or just interested in brainwaves, I think you need to know these basics because it will kind of give you this depth or perspective or kind of dimensionality uh, of uh, the knowledge and understanding of brainwaves. So uh, though I said just basic neurophysiology, we mainly we'll be talking about where and what is located, what the function is, generically about the brain and nervous system to start with, uh, because before you jump to brain waves, you need to understand, I mean, what I'm referring to when I'm explaining where they come from. So that's the main logic. So for those who don't know me, my name is Aksana Bandarchuk, and I'm Certified Awakened Mind Practitioner and Trainer, and I am Institute for the Awakened Mind Online Events Moderator. Uh, sometimes I'm a speaker, like today. And just uh, last year, in the end of last year, I did a BCI uh, Australia Certification course in Neurofeedback. And that's what inspired me to kind of do this presentation for you. I also have uh, an education in psychology, specializing as a teacher of psychology. And uh, one of my big field of interest in psychology is transpersonal psychology. For those who don't know what it is, in short, I always say it's the one that goes beyond behavior, the one which is more spiritual and embraces uh, all other sides of life. So it's more integral, so to say, and it embraces invisible dimensions of our realities. That's what I love. And uh, just before that, going into psychology, I got my first uh, degree in finance and international marketing. And over 10 years, I spent working uh, in corporations, mainly in marketing, but also as a business trainer. So that's the background. I made this program, uh, which was called 12 Amazing Facts on the EEG Neurofeedback and Human Brain uh, last year, I think in December. And for those of you who haven't seen this program, I highly recommend to watch it because I think it's good to know more since you come across the mind mirror, it means people will be asking you more questions in general about neurofeedback, what it is, what you may expect, how mind mirror is different. And I did my best to share, first of all, how mind mirror stands out and all other interesting facts about neurofeedback that I think more psychologists, more psychotherapists and doctors and in general people should know uh, because it has such a great potential and it's very promising. And that's the plan for uh, this particular topic. Uh, as was promised in the description, I uh, will be talking about uh, brain evolution, about uh, basic building blocks of our uh, nervous system, brain, and their role in self-regulation. I'll be talking about five patterns of dysregulation that normally is addressed, are addressed by neurofeedback. And then I want to cover maybe directly and indirectly the core mechanism lying behind peak performance and alpha theta neurofeedback, which I can consider to be the closest clinical neurofeedback uh, analogies to what we do with the mind mirror in our awakened mind training. And uh, the kind of the topic itself, uh, origin, normal, abnormal distribution and function of different brainwave categories, alpha, beta, gamma, theta, delta, I probably will leave till next time because, as I mentioned before, before we jump into explaining where they come from, it's good to understand at least these geographical locations in our brain and have some idea of how they function or how they relate to each other, how they communicate. Anyway, my uh, starting point always is zero. 
because I know that there may be people here who are for the first time. So my job is to make sure it's clear to everybody and a repetition is of the, the base of learning. So let's repeat, what is the mind mirror? And I'll focus on mind mirror versus clinical uh, EEG. And before we jump into there, let's remind the very basics of the basics, the basic definitions. So biofeedback, what is it? Uh, it's a popular word today, but what's it about? It is the process of gaining greater awareness of many physiological functions of one's own body, commercially by using electronic or other instruments and with the goal of being able to manipulate the body's system at will. So basically, we all know we have heartbeat, we all know we have a temperature, and kind of consciously, we, we, we cannot always know what's going on there. Uh, but we use a thermometer or uh, we use a pulse meter to check both. With the mind mirror, we check something else. We check the electrical activity of our brain, right? And what we can do, it's like mirror is a good word here, referring both to biofeedback and the mind mirror, because it's like looking in the mirror gives you an option, a chance to see what's wrong to become aware of what's wrong and be able to change it and gain some you know, control. What is EEG? Uh, it stands for electroencephalogram and it's the measurement of electrical patterns at the surface of the scalp, which reflect cortical activity and are commonly displayed as waves and referred to as brain waves. In more detail, what exactly we are measuring uh, with EEG uh, we will be talking probably next time because I want to start with more generic picture and go into more detail. So basically, we are talking about uh, uh, electricity in our brain. And in general, I'll just say that on a very profound level, uh, we can see everything as energy and information. To be precise, energy carrying information, right? So in a way, today we'll be looking at how this information is exchanged, you know, how we receive information from the external world and send information, like respond to this stimuli, respond to this information. So what's neurofeedback? Sometimes it's referred to EEG biofeedback or neurotherapy. So this is a type of biofeedback that presents real-time feedback from brain activity in order to reinforce healthy brain activity through operant conditioning. So we are trying to condition the brain to work in the more optimal way. Uh, during the neurofeedback sessions, your brain learns how to bring abnormally fast or slow waves into the normal range. You sit back, watch, listen, play, and receive visual, audio, or tactile feedback when your brain meets the set goals. So there are various ways how you can, your brain can learn, obviously. So we feed the information back and this information makes changes. And you may be aware and fully conscious and acknowledge what you receive. Say with the mind mirror, the practitioner can give you feedback of what's on the screen. Or as a self-trainer, you might look in the screen and see yourself what's going on with your brain waves. Or in a traditional clinical neurofeedback, very often you don't even have to acknowledge it. It's just your brain makes notes and uh, is really welcoming the guidance towards more balanced, more optimal, harmonious, efficient work because it always feels good. So when it feels good on every level, you want it. Your brain wants it. Your body wants it. You want it. So it's kind of addictive in a healthy way as well. So QEG, very often you may come across this abbreviation. What does it stand for? So it is a quantitative analysis of digitized EEG. Since these days, uh, we collect information in a digital form. So that allows for statistical comparisons with databases, norms, as well as brain mapping to identify the location of brain dynamics and dysfunction. So it's just a way to analyze energy that uh, will help you to 
kind of get an idea where what kind of dysfunction you might have. So mainly we are talking about the, the distribution of fast and slow brain waves or interconnectivity. So there should be proper balance of how these different categories play out their symphony in our brain together. There should be harmony. Uh, there shouldn't be over-dependence. They should be just right to the task at hand. So if you are stuck somewhere, if you are not flexible, that's no good. But you should still have some basic stability and your brain should have like good reaction and ability like with good flexible muscles, you know, to stretch and pull the necessary neurons together to perform this or that function. And this time I decided to add one more abbreviation that I think you might also need because you may hear it from others. So it's ERP, it stands for Event Related Potentials. You, it uses similar equipment to EEGs. And they measure brain response, but uh, brain response as a direct result of a specific sensory, cognitive, or motor event. So let's say more formally, it is any st stereotyped electrophysiological response to a stimulus. So when we are looking with the mind mirror at uh, the brain waves, it's kind of more generalized response, right? Across the whole brain. Because of course, uh, they will kind of resonate. The brain waves will resonate across the brain. But with event-related potentials, it gives you much more precise idea of where, say, uh, the stimuli is received. And here to the right, I forgot to mention it before, I have the illustration. So on top, you can see EEGs. Uh, in the middle, you can see these brain maps uh, as a result of QEG analysis. And in the bottom, I added a chart illustrating kind of how normally these event-related potentials are presented. So uh, they will present the timing, what happened when the stimuli was detected, recognized, and when you said, like when, it says action, that's when you press the button. And uh, you can see which frequency of the brain wave and which part of the brain was responding on each of the levels. So for different types of processes in our brain, like sensory perception, so we see cognitive process, and we recognize, then motor function, we have to press the button, right? We have to take an action. So in all these systems, we could exactly see what and how the brain responds. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very precise measurement of electricity in the brain. First of all, you probably know how the device looks like. What it consists of, you'll see we have Velistas DSU hardware. Velistas basically will mean that we may use it for Velistas software for clinical neurofeedback options. And we may uh, use the mind mirror software to see the brain waves in a way that we see. And I'll speak about it later. So we have five electrodes. It's called dual channel EEG uh, that we connect to the brain. Uh, in the machine, they all go in uh, the same port. Besides EEG, so besides measuring brain waves, we also have an option uh, to measure other physiological indicators. So we have galvanic skin response. It goes with a special sensor to measure mental, emotional arousal and relaxation. And we also have blood volume pulse sensor to monitor heart rate, heart rate variability, stress index, and more. Uh, we also have temperature sensor uh, you may get trigger button to set markers during peak experiences. And the combination of those sensors work as emotional sensor where you can kind of navigate how aroused, where you are, what's going on with you. So basically, it's also the biofeedback device. So we're not just measuring brain waves. We can back it up with other physiological indicators to uh, see the complete picture of what's going on. But of course, brain waves are the main ones that we look at. So uh, when we look uh, at the brain waves, we always see them as um, 
bands, colorful bands uh, that kind of move together. And here on the screen, you can see GIF. So you can see these bands moving. To the right, you can see how you normally would see uh, brain waves uh, in clinical world. So you see these wriggly waves that I bet it's quite hard to understand what's going on there unless you are trained and your eye is trained to recognize all these waves and to make sense out of it. So we see kind of more generalized picture of what's going on. The slowest frequencies are in the bottom, the fastest on top, and the categories are marked by color. So uh, you can see that orange yellow will be beta, uh, green alpha, blue theta, and in the bottom purple will be delta. And the green bars in the bottom will show the amplitude. In other terms, uh, explains how loud your brain waves are, how strong they are, right? How pronounced they are. So with the mind mirror, you can clearly see which brainwave category, for example, uh, is dominant. It's alpha here, right? And you can see what else is changing along the way. We also attribute uh, these categories to certain levels of consciousness. So we associate beta with conscious mind, uh, alpha with the bridge, uh, theta with subconscious mind, and delta with unconscious mind. And in more detail, of course, I'll refer to this and go back to this when we'll be looking at the function of brain waves uh, in science, how in clinical world, what normal functions are attributed to uh, each of the categories. And once more, the mind mirror gives us an ability to master navigation across the states of consciousness by receiving feedback about our brainwave patterns. I'll be very short here. I'll just say we all usually start with the ordinary pattern. And you can see that beta, busy, fast brainwaves are common in this state. Then awakened mind pattern will mean we have to open our alpha bridge. And uh, we aim to make pattern uh, be balanced to a certain ratios, how they relate. Uh, so we always want uh, alpha to be twice bigger than beta and theta to be 1.6 of theta and uh, delta could be around one. Uh, and um, that will give you this shape. And then as we continue, as you go into deeper, higher, bigger perspective and state, we call it evolved mind pattern. It's a state of oneness and unity where you kind of open all the bottlenecks and it makes your pattern look like a circle. That's the dynamics that we want to see uh, when we work with the mind mirror. That's the that's goal. Cool. It's important to keep in mind that with the mind mirror, uh, we have, as I mentioned, five electrodes. One electrode is ground, so it's kind of reference to filter out all the noise from what actually matters. And then the four other electrodes, they go into certain same locations each time. So we place uh, two electrodes on temporal lobes on each side. So it's just above the left ear and right ear. And then we place the other two in the back of the head on occipital lobe, uh, uh, again, on the left and right hemisphere. So we always train left and right. Uh, so the whole head. And we always do the same locations. In clinical world, locations could be different depending on the problem. So here to the right, I just showed like the possibility of where they can be. And to give you an idea of these strange codes here, if you don't know, they basically refer to the lobes of the brain and uh, the left hemisphere will have uh, odd numbers uh, and uh, the right hemisphere will have even numbers and the central line will have letter Z instead of a number. So that, that's what it is. So that's why the closest locations we could identify with Judith. Uh, it will be T3, T5. So it's temporal lobe on the left, T4, T6, temporal lobe on the right and O1, uh, occipital lobe on the left, O2 occipital lobe on the right. 
So that's uh, about this. And then uh, depending on where you put the electrodes, of course, you may see different picture. Again, as I said, most of brain waves, of course, they work together. They resonate throughout the brain. But again, the epicenter, so to say, <laughs> of the frequency uh, may look different depending on where you stick the electrodes. So we will be talking about these locations next time. Right now, I just want you to have a look here uh, uh, because we want to know where the brain waves come from. So, for example, delta, the slowest brain waves, it says cortical sheet dipoles. So we need to know more about cortex. Theta, uh, limbic septal hippocampal or slowed thalamocortical alpha. So, okay, generator source, we need to know more about limbic system. And we definitely need to have a closer look at thalamocortical communication and understand what that is. So alpha, thalamocortical thalamic, again, same words, thalamus, cortex, beta, cortical cortex, and gamma will be about neural networks. So right now, the goal for today is to cover the basics so we understand all these references, uh, where they are, and their basic functions. Then the third uh, important thing we need to keep in mind, mind mirror training and neurofeedback, clinical neurofeedback training what and how. So when we do the mind mirror training, we can train preset patterns with or without meditations according to Anawise protocol. We have a meditation pattern, awakened mind, evolved mind and gamma synchrony. If you want to learn more about this, this is not the topic of this program, but I already mentioned, mentioned the basic ones, awakened mind and evolved mind, talking about dynamics. And then we have self-training programs uh, automatic training similar to clinical neurofeedback where you can feed the sound back or the music back or even uh, with the uh, additional uh, program like watch videos and receive uh, feedback through video quality as well. So the programs are beta reduction, alpha synchrony, alpha theta and delta. So in neurofeedback training, we train individually adjusted frequencies and they could be inhibit. So we suppress something, reward, squash uh, and other protocols. It's automatic training mode there is more common, although exercises and visualizations might be used at any time. And of course, successful neurofeedback training will come along with uh, some type of psychotherapy. It doesn't stand alone. You always need to talk about your goals, what you felt, your experiences, how to help you integrate, uh, kind of make the best use out of it. So it's just a way to facilitate. And with the mind mirror training, uh, the feedback can be provided by practitioner or it can be audio, as I mentioned, just uh, some sound, corn sound, for example, or music or it can be video via patterns or feedback feedback. And in neurofeedback training, it can be also audio, visual, or tactile. Another important point here is that clinical neurofeedback implies medical or therapeutical treatment of borderline or beyond healthy spectrum patients, while mind mirror is mainly for healthy clients, mental fitness and self-exploration. Though with a certain type of problems, mind here can help as well if you are qualified uh, psychologist, for example, to treat certain uh, mental disorders, I bet you can find the way how to use mind here there as well. So now, central nervous system, building blocks, basic anatomy and physiology. I'll start with the very, very basics. And I bet you know all of this maybe from school, but it's always good to remind uh, ourselves. Uh, our nervous system is our main command center. So basically everything that you <laughs> are able to do <laughs> that makes you alive <laughs> is, uh, becomes possible due to your nervous system. So it's that energy information network uh, that makes you alive and makes you human. So let's see what's in there. We have central nervous system, 
that we are going to talk about today, which contains brain and spinal cord. So brain responsible for receiving and processing information and initiating responses. So it's our head office. And spinal cord uh, conducts signals to and from the brain and controls reflexes. So it's kind of our main distribution channel, so to say, for our energy information. And here on the left, you can see the picture, which in red shows the, uh, the central nervous system uh, main uh, parts, brain and the spinal cord. Besides central nervous system, we have also peripheral nervous system, which uh, consists of motor neurons. So this will be the communication of the head office with all the muscles and glands and responsible for helping us to perform movement, right, action. And then there will be another big part of peripheral nervous system containing sensory neurons, which uh, general sensory information from organs and receptors to our head office, to central nervous system. I won't go more into detail there because it's outside of today's topic. And here I made a nice insert just to remind ourselves when we talk about nervous system that we mainly mean two categories, two types of cells uh, that are able to pass this information, pass uh, electrical impulses that make communication possible throughout the body. So neuron, that's why we say neurofeedback, for example. Neuron is a specialized nervous system cell designed to transmit information to other nerve cells, muscle or gland cells. A typical neuron is comprised of a cell body. Uh, here it's usually called soma. You can see the nucleus in it and uh, nerve fibers represented by dendrites. Here are these short, they look like branches, right? Branches of a tree. And there are lots of them on serving a special purpose because they are there to receive incoming signals from other neurons. So there is nothing to be missed. You need lots of branches to receive. And uh, it also has an axon which is uh, the other end of it, which uh, sends signals further on. So it's like a chain of these neurons communicating and it sends signal away from the cell body towards the synapse where the neuron communicates with one or multiple other neurons. So at the end of axon, there will be this place and uh, synapse is common word that you may come across. So you understand that's where the information exchange happens chemically, electronically, or mechanically triggered. There are many ways, but that's the place. Multiple axons work together in parallel, and they are referred to as a nerve. So now we understand what neuron is and what nerve is. And just for your reference, human brain contains two different theories, at least 86 billion neurons. So this absolutely unimaginable number and you can imagine the level, like how highly organized it should be. And uh, the capacity of our brain computer is really amazing. Another important term we need to know uh, when we talk about brain waves, pyramidal neurons or cells are the most frequent type of neurons in the cortex, suggesting that they are necessary for the processing of external signals and motor control. So this will be pyramidal neurons that change their polarity, perform the action, and there's electrical shifts uh, we pick up with our electrodes and then amplify with our equipment and see on the screen in the form of the wave or the band. Then another word you may come across, glia or glial cells. What are they? They are non-neuronal cells in the nervous system that do not produce electrical impulses, but they maintain homeostasis for myelin in the peripheral nervous system and provide the necessary support and protection for neuronal function. So uh, myelin, you may not know what that is, but you can see this picture here and myelin, you can see this white 
kind of cover. So this is insulation, so to say. So glia glial cells are important because they basically surround our neurons and help them function well. So they can help not to lose the signal as it travels. That's what this myelin stands for. And they'll do all other functioning. They'll do the cleaning and healing <laughs> and all other little important functions to support the main function of communication, passing the information uh, performed by neurons. Okay, and here comes the brain evolution slide. I put it here because this is something that you probably know from training with Judith. This is the simplified model, but it still makes sense to refer to it and maybe even start with it. That's why I put it here in the very beginning. We can divide the brain into three parts. But again, remember that whenever we divide anything, we dissect anything. I know that used to be the habit of the way the research was performed in the materialistic paradigm. But really, uh, we have to remember that everything works together and one is not separate from the other. So keep that in mind. Even though we say they are separate, it just to help us grasp it. So the most ancient brain, 100 million years old, and is called reptilian, uh, primal, lizard brain, or even gut brain. And it sits in the brainstem and cerebellum and is responsible for our basic survival functions. You can call it in one word, animal brain. And it's responsible for survival, safety, security. So that's why fight and flight sits there. Your instincts sit there and automatic functions sit there that you are not aware of. The next brain, which is more advanced, obviously, it's called mammal brain or emotional brain or heart brain. It's uh, younger. It's, a, it's believed to be 50 million years old. And as the name suggests, it uh, comes with mammals and a class of animals that feed their babies with milk. And they show a next level attachment to their babies, some type of attachment and emotions. And we call it also limbic brain and associate with the limbic system, responsible for not just emotions, but also memories and habits and attachments. So the next one, most advanced brain and the youngest of all, it's a head brain, our human brain, it's neocortex outer part of the cerebral cortex which is responsible for higher functions of course language abstract thought imagination consciousness reasoning rationalizing so this is the rational brain it has most power over lower brains and that's what really can make us uh, humans and give us completely different ability to operate in this world so to simplify, let's think of the lowest brain as animal brain or responsible for your life on the physical level. And then um, this middle limbic, it's emotional brain, uh, responsible for your uh, emotions and attachments. And they are basically guiding our behavior. And then the human brain is the rational one, which now can verbalize experience, which now can make abstractions and see the perspective and see the future and set the goals and apply reasoning. So it's completely different level of operation, which makes us human. So once again, primal emotional and rational mental activities are the product of neural activity in more than one of the three regions addressed in McLean's model. And their collective energy creates human experience. So they all work at the same time in us.
After we spoke uh, about this three brain model, I'll talk basically about the same things, but in different wording. Here is simplified structure presented in a very basic symbolic way, but I absolutely loved it because it made it easy to memorize. So what are the four main nervous system building blocks? So this is cortex right on the top. And this is uh, this rational part of the brain. This uh, round circle here or we'll refer to as subcortical nuclei. So these are groups of neurons collaborating to perform specialized functions. And just referring to the previous slide, the limbic system or emotional brain will sit there. And then this will be the brainstem. And that's uh, what we refer to as animal or reptilian brain. And that's the last part, the spinal cord, which allows us to first collect the information from our senses and pass uh, the signal back for the action, for the movement and uh, behavior. So let's speak about the key things we need to remember about each of these blocks, starting with the cortex. So cortex will be at the highest level of the central nervous system. And again, as I just mentioned, that's uh, this human brain, the highest, the head brain. So a large, thin sheet of brain cells, which is highly folded, will fit more surface area within our skulls, consisting of gray matter. Gray matter is comprised of neural cell bodies, their dendritic interconnections and supporting glial cells. Gray matter is involved in information processing. So when we refer to cortex, yes, this is this part of the brain uh, with the neocortex as the very top layer of it, uh, which we say, oh, it's, it's how much gray matter you have, how much thinking capacity you have. So this is all there. And uh, yes, it's highly folded. And uh, these folds, they have special names. So we can see hills and valleys. Or in other words, we call them like here will be gyrus, in plural, uh, gyri, and uh, the valley or uh, the groove will be called uh, sulcus or fissure. It's really deep sulcus or in plural, sulci. So I thought that's important to mention because this deep grooves, um, sulci or fissures, uh, they'll uh, separate our whole cortex into parts, very distinct parts with their distinct functions. And here they are, they're called lobes. And uh, you can see we have frontal lobe in the front and central fissure separates frontal lobe from parietal lobe. Then we have C lateral fissure that separates this frontal and parietal from temporal lobes. And then we have occipital lobe in the back. And of course, few times, uh, I think uh, across this presentation today, I'll be speaking about the functions. Don't worry, I think you'll have some information left in your brain after the whole lot. So what else is there? White and gray matter, I think they are very popular and many people refer to them. So I thought it's important to pay attention to that as well. So the central nervous system is comprised of white and gray matter. Um, white matter refers to areas of the central nervous system that are mainly made up of myelinated axons. And just before I mentioned and pointed out, this is this insulation around axons of neurons, also called tracts. White matter affects learning and brain functions, modulating the distribution of action potentials, insulating the signal traveling through neuron, acting as a relay and coordinating communication between different brain regions. Neuron-rich brain regions wouldn't count for much without the rich veins of axonal connections contained with white matter to join them up. Gray matter consists primarily of neuronal cells, body soma. This is a spherical structure that houses the neuron's nucleus. So that gives you more idea of why we see this gray contour on top and why we see this white stuff in the middle if we dissect, you know, the brain. And ventricles. Ventricles are a set of four interconnected cavities 
in the middle of the brain, which are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid protects the brain from pressure changes and plays a role in immune and homeostatic functions. So yeah, you may think of the brain as something hard and static. It's actually not. <laughs> Uh, it looks quite soft and it can even, you know, change and move. Okay, here very roughly, and we'll come back to it again. You've just seen on the previous picture, not very nice looking, a uh, real brain, how it looks like. You can distinctly see both hemispheres. And you have to remember they stand, they have different functions. So right is holistic and conceptual. It's about big picture more intuitive, general, uh, empathetic, figurative, irregular, emotional, and left brain uh, is more analytical, logical, precise, repetitive, organized. It's more about details, more scientific, more detached, more literal and sequential. So we'll come back to it again. And the lobes, they also have their functions. And again, uh, I'll come back to it. But to start with, we can start with the frontal lobe because that's that main rational center, uh, basically of uh, higher functions where we can uh, solve problems uh, with the reasoning or judgment, uh, speaking, voluntary motor activity, movement comes from there. Parietal lobe is our main uh, sensory hub along with the temporal. So parietal will be knowing right from left, uh, sensation, reading, body orientation. And again, that's very roughly, we'll go into more detail. Temporal lobe, it's about understanding language, uh, because it uh, ordinary centers sit there. So we hear uh, behavior, memory and hearing. Occipital lobe, vision and color perception. So it's all about vision and it's in the back. And uh, just to remind you, point your uh, attention that we attach electrodes with the mind mirror onto temporal lobe and the keywords there will be uh, language, behavior, memory and later maybe I'll add the one more word emotion. Wherever you see behavior you can add emotion because that's kind of the signpost or behavior guidance. The other two electrodes go in the very back of the head and they are responsible for it's occipital lobe for vision. So we stick electrodes to the points that basically help us decipher what we hear and see, how we perceive this world, because it's not just our physical senses of hearing and vision uh, and processing of those. It's also filtered through our perception, through our previous experience and memories. So really, the points that we use, they do describe how we see the world, perceive the world. Then another important thing to know, it's uh, corpus callosum. It's called tough body from Latin, and it's the fiber that connects left and right hemisphere and enables communication between them. And of course, it becomes very important in basic emotional, behavioral, memory, attention, and social functions, because we have most of parts of the brain, they're duplicating on the left and side, and they serve slightly different purposes. And an interesting fact is that we know that there are a lot of differences between male and female brain. And one of them is that uh, this colossum cross-sectional area on average is proportionally larger in females. So we know that Often left brain is attributed to males and right brain uh, to females, but really uh, the corpus callosum is responsible to make sure they perform together. So that means uh, there is integration between both sides and it looks like females have some advantage there. It is uh, the largest white matter structure in the human brain. Yes, because white matter is about connecting. Uh, about 10 centimeters in length and consists of 200 to 300 million axonal projections. So again, it's an unimaginable number. The central nervous system building block, the next one, subcortical nuclei. Basically, the word suggests it's something that sits below cortex. 
logically. And we mean diverse neural formations within the brain. They will include the encephalon, pituitary gland, limbic structures, and the basal ganglia. We'll talk about the most important of them later. And they are involved in complex activities such as memory, emotion, pleasure, and hormone production. They act as information hubs of the nervous system as they relay and modulate information passing to different areas of the brain. These deeper parts of our central nervous system drive much of our behavior, even though they're below the awareness of our conscious mind. So here, I want to make a kind of pause and just uh, remind you that we were talking about cortex and we were talking about all this higher uh, conscious function. So it does look like when we talk about what we are conscious of, we are talking about beta and beta sits in our cortex and then uh, or, uh, is produced there, right, distributed there. Now we are going deeper. So we're going on that level which sits below our awareness level. It doesn't mean that we're completely not aware of what's happening with our senses and inside of our body bits. It's mainly, you know, sensation and memory and this and that. But part of it we can be consciously aware of, part of it we are not consciously be aware of. So again, logically, you may assume that if we are talking about this uh, sensory awareness, we should think of alpha. We should think of uh, the bridge which connects conscious mind with its subconscious mind. So connecting what we know of with the automatic uh, subconscious functions and body operation. So that's just a remark. And again, we'll talk about it later in more detail. And uh, subcortical nuclei, it's very easy to see when you slice off the big uh, cortex, which makes the largest part of our brain looking like a walnut. If we slice it out and imagine brain as a pitch, uh, the cross section of that pitch, we'd see the outer skin, the flesh and an inner stone. The skin is analogous to the cerebral cortex. The fleshy part is the deep white matter and the stone represents the subcortical structures. So now I guess it became much more simple for you to understand what's going on there. And here special attention should go to thalamus. Because maybe you remember in the beginning, I mentioned that when we talk about all of them, beta, alpha, and theta, you'll hear thalamus being mentioned. So what is it? Thalamus sits in the very, very middle of your brain. You can see this nice gift picture showing where it sits on both sides, left and right hemisphere, and acts as a main relay station or a hub which relays information between different subcortical areas and the cerebral cortex. So to be precise, every sensory system, with the exception of the olfactory system, includes a thalamic nucleus that receives sensory signals and sends them to the associated primary cortical area. The thalamus is believed to both process sensory information as well as relay it. Each of the primary sensory relay areas receives strong feedback connections from the cerebral cortex. So it's the one in charge of communication, kind of the main, I don't know, receiving hub and redistribution center, this center that collects all the information from sensors and then uh, sends the information to the cortex, to the head office for instructions. And then instructions are produced and sends it back. It plays an important role in regulating states of sleep and wakefulness, regulating arousal, level of awareness and activity. So in this sense, he uh, is uh, cooperating a lot with uh, the basic functions of brainstem or basal ganglia, to be precise, uh, that are responsible for our wakefulness states. And uh, damage to the thalamus can lead to permanent coma. Thalamus fulfills a key function in providing the specific channels from the basal ganglia and cerebellum to the cortical motor areas. I just mentioned that. Cerebellum is about uh, balance and body coordination. And recent research suggests that the medial dorsal thalamus, it's just the position of it, uh, more like to the top and to the center, may play a 
broader role in cognition. Specifically, the medial dorsal thalamus may amplify the connectivity signaling strength of uh, just the circuits in the cortex appropriate for the current context and thereby contribute to the flexibility of the mammalian brain to make complex decisions by wiring the many associations on which decisions depend into weakly connected cortical circuits. So how I understand it, it uh, makes sure that relevant information is picked and irrelevant information is ignored. And partially, when we will be talking about uh, peak performance, we have to keep in mind that role of thalamus, because when you want to perform well, it implies you have to make the best use of your resources. And the brain works in energy saving mode where you should use really minimum resources to perform the function. So it means you should, you can see the amount, unimaginable amount of cells of neurons that uh, communicate each time to make you perform a certain function. So you have to be very precise. This precision and timing are very important because you need to cut off what is not necessary and leave what is necessary. And that makes you a peak and good performer. If thalamus is the one which is basically an information hub or center, for instructions, sensory uh, instructions, hypothalamus is more about, hypo means under, so it's another organ sitting under. It will give instructions to the body and run endocrine system and autonomic functions. So it's kind of a deputy which helps to pass on the information to the body through chemical reactions in endocrine system by controlling many important mechanisms related to survival, such as food and fluid intake, sleeping, metabolism, and body temperature. The hypothalamus uh, enables a state of physiological equilibrium, body homeostasis. So you see they are sitting together and this is the very, very center of our brain. This is the main hub, without which basically we are not alive. You know, if you take thalamus out, you are in coma. Not much is happening, just automatic function sustained. And the next very important bit is limbic system. And I will show two minute video, which very well explains the key parts of the limbic system. You can always go back and watch it from two minute uh, neuroscience uh, YouTube channel. Welcome to two minute neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the limbic system. The word limbic comes from the Latin limbus, which means border, and the limbic system was given this name because its structures lie along a horseshoe-shaped area of cortex that appears to be a border between the cerebral cortex and the subcortical structures of the diencephalon. There are many processes associated with the limbic system, but the system is most frequently linked to emotion. There is no consensus on the structures that are considered a part of the limbic system and some argue that it is too much of a simplification to consider something as complex as emotion to be handled by one group of brain structures. Regardless, these are some structures that are often included in the limbic system. The amygdala is an almond-shaped collection of nuclei found in the temporal lobe that seems to be especially involved with fearful and anxious emotions. The hippocampus is next to and interconnected with the amygdala. Although it is considered part of the limbic system, the hippocampus is generally associated with memory more so than emotion. The parahippocampal gyrus is an area of cortex that surrounds the hippocampus and also plays a role in memory. The cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus is found just above the corpus callosum and is involved in various aspects of emotion and memory. The septal nuclei have connections with a number of other limbic structures and are thought to be especially important to pleasure, reward, and reinforcement. The mammillary bodies are two groups of nuclei that are involved in memory and have extensive connections with the amygdala and hippocampus. The fornix is a fiber bundle that carries information from the hippocampus to the mammillary bodies and then onto the thalamus. The hypothalamus controls hormone release via the anterior pituitary and can exert widespread influence over bodily states to maintain homeostasis. While there are other structures that may be included in the limbic system, the structures identified here are some that are commonly considered part of it.
probably before this lecture, you come across the main parts of limbic system like amygdala, which is the alert center of the whole body. It's like, is it dangerous? Am I safe? So all these signals, they come from there. And another important part of limbic system is hippocampus responsible for memories and memory formation. And when we talk about memory, we should always think about learning. So these are two things, actually, I want you to remember to simplify the whole lot, because this is a lot of information. And then the next part of the next block, building block, is a brainstem. Once again, it is an extension of the spinal cord. Look, uh, this picture well shows that it's just the very top part of the spinal cord, which kind of enters our head. So it transmits information from the spinal cord and cerebellum. Cerebellum is this big bit here, uh, responsible for balance, coordination, control, voluntary movement, and fine muscle control. They work together to coordinate basic vital body functions. So you can, I think it's quite logical to place this bit on the very top of the spinal cord, uh, just below your brain, <laughs> because, yeah, these are very, very vital things, controlling blood pressure, it means oh, your heart function, breathing, uh, balance, uh, taste, hearing, muscle control, fine muscle control, and autonomic function of arousal and alertness via reticular forma uh, formation. So that's the part that keeps uh, signals about when you should be awake or when you can go to sleep. And then spinal cord obviously extends down the length of the spine and provides input and output to the body and coordinates some functions at that local level. So here, by now, we covered all four bits of the central nervous system. And now let's talk about them once again but now focus more on their function and implications for neurofeedback. So once again, we have the information coming in from all the senses. And we have to remember, we collect information from external environment for our five sensory systems and maybe six system as well. Six sense, I mean. And we collect information from our internal organs as well, though we may not be aware of it, that happens and all information goes into the brain. And then based on this information, the very uh, top center, the cortex, performs its function. So it's a slower function, which is about detailed analysis of sensory input and selection control of behavioral output action. Subcortical nuclei, they are responsible for rapid assessment of and response to danger and opportunity. These survival responses are more rapid than the detailed analysis and response at a cortical level. They constantly shape our perception and behavior below our conscious awareness or control and are responsible for our learned fears and habits. So it's quite obvious that this particular function need to happen much, much faster because we need to respond. And that's why sometimes we can react and do something that we can regret often because it was triggered by this part of our brain and cortex with its slower function just had no time to step in and say no and stop us. So brainstem, processing sensory input and controlling motor output to orient us to the environment, regulates vital functions essential for life, breathing, sleep, wake cycle, body temperature, etc. Brainstem function with a traumatic brain injury, for example, can have a severe impact on basic life supporting functions. And then spinal cord. Body sensation sensor input and movement motor output according to reflexes or high level instructions. I think that starts to make it clear. Plus, as you will later see, input back out front. And this is true because when we look at the cortex, we will see that all sensory bits are placed in the back, in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the executive functions, the high output functions, uh, they will be placed in the frontal part of the northern hemisphere of our brain. So input and output functions are not sequential, but rather simultaneous, though we may like to think of them as sequential. Perception guides action and action also guides perception. Our needs and desires guide both. Back and front areas of the central nervous system work together. Parietal and frontal cortical areas, for example, work together to guide movement. Parietal, it means sensory functions and frontal means executive functions or action output. Prefrontal areas hold the plan and the limbic areas set priorities. Again, prefrontal, it means here. Limbic areas set the filters for our perception based on our previous experience. Is it safe? Is it not? Is it dangerous? Is it not? Can I stay? What should I do first? What should I do second? Perception then should be seen as a directed purposeful process that is driven by the brain's needs and expectations. A very important concept that we need to know and understand and never overlook when we are dealing with neurofeedback. So this is physiological arousal and activation. What do I mean by that? It's readiness to attend and respond and regulation of brain states. Cortex, slower actions based on cognitive appraisal and goals. Brainstem, physiological arousal, overall arousal and ton for the body. And subcortical nuclei, activation of specific brain areas support specific brain functions. So how does the brain select and organize its input and output functions? Physiological arousal and activation are key contributors to this brain state regulation. First, the brainstem manages physiological arousal level, the general tone of the central nervous system. Subcortical nuclei are then involved in more specific control of activation. Specific brain areas are activated to allow specific functions preparing for specific perception and response. And then how does the brain choose a state of readiness and specific functions to activate? This brings us to drives and emotions and the limbic system. As I mentioned, limbic system uh, will be sitting here in subcortical nuclei. And this part is responsible for assessed danger we just learned about amygdala and rewards opportunities. Yes, because our memory sits there as well. Uh, the hippocampus responsible for memory and learning sits there as well. So basically both will guide our behavior. And if you like some um, metaphysical remark, I should say that in a materialistic world, a psychology used to look at behavior as just response to stimuli. So as a very sequential and kind of sometimes victimized procedure where you are the victim of the stimuli. But in reality, uh, we are much more complex and we work more, our brain works more in anticipation and prediction of things. And this anticipation and prediction works more like based on your previous experience, which means uh, based on what you learned, based on your memory, based on how you were formed as you were growing since you were in your mom's belly. So what kind of level of arousal, how much stress your mom had or how relaxed she was, all of that goes into your system and creates the foundation for a model of prediction for the future. So your brain constantly is trying to anticipate certain situation and match the reality and makes constant adjustments to it. We are not just living by the past. We are more using the past to form or shape our future. And we are continuously correcting our uh, this approximation to reality to match it. Let's continue. So here, limbic system. Danger, opportunity, subconscious fears and habits, priorities and motivation, controlled brainstem arousal and activation, immune endocrine and autonomic regulation. Obviously, because we just spoke about uh, thalamus and hypothalamus and they do those. 
brainstem, control of emotional ton, how, how aroused you are, cortex, conscious goals, and top-down regulation. Limbic system, obviously, is critically important for our ongoing survival, but it can become a problem when out of balance. In life-threatening situations, we learn life-preserving behaviors, which sometimes continue after the danger has passed. Those with post-traumatic stress disorder are unable to inhibit the subconscious reaction, even though they understand consciously that it is no longer needed. With neurofeedback for PTSD, we calm the agitation and hypervigilance and then allow resolution of traumatic memories with alpha theta training. So that's, that's an example of what happens. And on another note, uh, I should say that uh, limbic system is very much like um, preschool age child before school age. And that's when most of the children, they don't have any concept of uh, the future or the past. Uh, all they have is the present moment. So uh, very often when uh, we have these memories, traumatic memories, we always relieve them as present. So that's kind of the biggest problem with trauma because anything in the present moment may trigger or will remind us of this traumatic experience and we'll be constantly asking for resolution. And good news, neurofeedback can help there. And alpha theta, it means this uh, slower brain waves. We'll speak about it again when we get away from our cortex and dive uh, in when we are relaxed and we can dive in into this limbic system and rearrange, relieve, reintegrate our experiences. That's when we resolve uh, trauma. That's when we liberate ourselves or at least we find acceptance. We can't change the past, but we stop hiccuping with it in our everyday life. Okay, uh, cortex, top-down inhibitory control. So cortical areas have inhibitory control over lower brain regions and their automatic reactions. This allows time for detailed sensory analysis and consideration of priorities and possible consequences before selecting and executing a response. The prefrontal cortex is the highest level with inhibitory control over all lower areas of the central nervous system. Good prefrontal function is essential for self-control and mature behavior. I think this is not a surprise after all the material that we covered. Uh, we know that uh, our cortex, it's our rational brain which sits in the hierarchy much higher than emotional brain or limbic brain and which sits much higher than animal brain, obviously. So it has the perspective and powers to control both, but it lacks speed, we have to remember. Another important uh, concept that we have to keep in mind, self-regulation. Um, once again, when we talk about neurofeedback, we basically have to say that we are uh, helping uh, to restore the body self-regulation. So what is self-regulation? It's about automatic, unconscious, or physiological, function, or physiological functions and underlies efficient and effective functioning of brain and body. So by default in nature, we are programmed to, to find balance. In my previous presentation about these 12 amazing facts, I was talking that it's really important uh, to be in balance. You will see that Buddhism will be talking about middle path. Sacred geometry will be talking about golden mean. And shamanism will be talking about restoring balance because that's how shamans look at the world when they see uh, that, that there is a need for healing. It means balance need to be restored. So too much or too little is no good. Overconnected, overdependent, or underconnected is no good. There should be golden mean. There should be this balance, and this balance implies health. This balance implies effective, efficient functioning. So what neurofeedback does? It promotes self-regulation. It enhances flexibility and stability of state. So once again, self-regulation implies 
we don't get stuck. We have certain stability that we are able to maintain and we have flexibility. And then your feedback improves health and well-being, obviously as a result of all of the above and reduces dysregulation and suffering. So what are the major five patterns of dysregulation? I'll name them here, and then we will go through them in more detail. So first of all, physiological arousal. Dysregulation of arousal or excitability usually comes from developmental trauma. So what we mean by that, if your mom was stressing out when you were sitting in her belly, just developing as an embryo, uh, you already will probably record the underlying arousal, usual mode of behavior. And then as you continue with your life, your own personal individual life experience, you may get more and more layers on top of that, but you probably have this uh, usual level of arousal for yourself how sensitive, highly aroused, excitable, or under-aroused you are. So when we talk about it, we understand that your arousal will or is closely connected and will affect your attention, mood, physical tension, and thinking. Instabilities, that's the loss of stability. It uh, usually comes from genetic background or may be a result of brain injury. And here we talk about headaches, mood swings, panic attacks, or seizures. Disinhibition, it means when your prefrontal self-control is not working properly. So your cortex is not able to suppress uh, immature and primitive behavior coming from lower levels, lower brains. And thus you uh, can be impulsive or emotional reactive. Uh, then we may talk about localized dysfunctions. And that just means uh, usually trauma or injury or certain part of the brain. And then we'll talk about learned fears and habits and how implicit and explicit memories interfere with behavioral control and well-being. So, and, and once again, it's uh, either our early development, general development, trauma. Okay, arousal. I just mentioned the uh, brainstem, which is the place, uh, the seat of reticular activating system, controls the overall arousal tone for central nervous system. People respond individually to arousal shifts. It affects attention, mood, physical tension, thinking, which involve other more specific brain functions. So we can see that on the low end of arousal, we are asleep, sedated, on the higher level, we are agitated, or on the very top level, extreme level, we are in emergency mode or panic mode. So the norm for our normal everyday functioning is somewhere in the middle. Obviously, uh, we need both. High arousal is useful in emergencies, but getting stuck there can lead to significant problems. In emergency mode, we hyper-focus on the emergency and ignore our bodies and our future plans. So that's why in panic mode, you hardly ever will be able to see any opportunity because you're facing the wall. All you see is your danger and you can't see that there are like that poor fly. I mentioned in one of my presentations, you can't just a step back and see that maybe the door is opening towards you or maybe like that fly in the window, there is the part of the window which is open and you can just fly out. There is no point in bumping your head at the window again and again. Low arousal states are essential for rest and sleep, but can interfere with good alert functioning during the day. Our goal with neurofeedback is to improve flexibility and stability of state regulation, not just to move the person's arousal level. So uh, I'll explain a bit more how this arousal level uh, relates to our brain waves. We can be underactive and we can be overactive. Let's start maybe from overactive state, when we are impulsive, hyperactive, when we're anxious, when we have anger, rage reactions, when we show obsessive compulsive symptoms, tick disorders, and difficulty falling asleep at night. That mainly means that we have lots of running beta, and that's how our ordinary state would look like with beta being dominant. When we have too much of it, 
we will be experiencing mind chatter, unable to relax, tense, and all of these hyperarousal moments that I just mentioned. When we set beta back to the norm, it will imply we need some beta for good active thinking and being engaged and for switching on our memory to verbalize, we need beta. So that's why we need just right mid-range beta to operate. When we don't have enough of it, we may feel tired or depressed or unmotivated. So as I said, too much or too low is no good. Sensory motorism, uh, that's what SMI here stands for. And it shows the frequencies which we normally attribute to our beta range. So you can think of it as low beta. Uh, you can feel uh, depressed if you have too much of it, or you can feel scattered if you have too little of it. And you feel calm, relaxed, and mentally alert when you're right there. This is why uh, most common uh, training for peak performance would be training on this sensory motor rhythm or training on this low beta frequencies from 12 to 5, 15 hertz and do it in the very middle of the brain, basically in the vertex or crossroads of all the crossroads, the, the, the busiest crossroad in your brain town, uh, because this will be the, the, the main crossroad. So all main pathways will go there. This low beta is that energy saving optimal condition that helps you to prepare for action. So you don't waste your energy. Okay, alpha. So when you have too much of it, you will be anxious and hypervigilant too, though we have different view on alpha in the mind mirror. Just enough alpha would mean calm focus and too little will mean exhaustion. Then theta, uh, too much of theta may mean drowsy and daydreamy. So you may be losing it unless you experience meditator. Just right theta would mean you are connecting with your intuition well and too little will mean your emotional awareness drops down. You're more like in autopilot mode. And delta, we know delta, we often associate delta with sleep as well as theta. Delta is really deep restful sleep when your body goes into restoration mode, self-repair mode. So when we have too much of it, we feel depressed or sluggish. And when we have just right of delta when we need it, we have restful sleep. When we have too little of delta, we have poor sleep. So that's how basically all the brainwave categories relate to different sides of arousals. The recommendation is always to see kind of in this spectrum, it's very easy spectrum to look at where the person is. Is uh, he or she either, uh, either overactive? or underactive and if we see the signs of inattention low energy depression problems with awakening most likely somebody's underactive or if we see too much obsessive compulsive symptoms very energetic overly energetic person and difficulty falling asleep we see that problem is overactivity a few points here that are important. Let's not mix up activation and arousal because this is a common mistake. Elevated low frequency activity in the baseline EEG is not necessarily indicator of low arousal. So when we talk about arousal, we mean general state of alertness, general ability to focus, how clear your thinking is, how easily you can memorize, how wasteless your behavior your actions are so there may be a lack of appropriate activation of some parts of the nervous system even while the whole brain is in a state of normal or even high arousal this might be related to brain injury or developmental disorders so as you know to have a clear focus you have your to have your cortex healthy and functioning what if some parts of your cortex were not developed properly or were just damaged. Uh, so that means in this case that you'll have to activate those parts of the brain to make sure you know the brain is performing healthy. Arousal and reward deficits. It's another interesting and important point. 
because reward deficiency is a limbic issue, not low arousal. Because sometimes you may feel low because your motivation is not working and motivation is not working because there is a bug sitting in your uh, limbic system, in your reward system. So reward deficits relate to deficiencies in interest, pleasure and engagement, while arousal relates to core wakefulness. Those with a reward deficiency might lack interest and engagement in normal activities presenting as depression, or they might escalate to thrill-seeking behavior in order to feel alive, seeking a reward rather than wakefulness. We all need rewards to stay alive. Reward satisfied drives either to achieve pleasure or to escape from suffering or both. Those who experience unrelenting misery and lack feelings of pleasure, safety and of self-worth will take great risks of, for moments of peace, security, or pleasure. Those with reward deficiency are vulnerable to addictive substances and behaviors, which turn on their reward systems that were not responding to more normal stimuli. So once again, it may not be necessarily the sign of general body arousal, kind of general uh, tone. It may be the result of healthy uh, drives, healthy emotions, healthy reward system which sit in your uh, limbic system so we all normally seek security we seek pleasure uh, or some high interests but if it's not working it's not working so its system is out of order high arousal versus hyper excitability high arousal typically results from developmental trauma and responds best to right side coming hyper excitability refers to instability and is generally a genetic trait or the consequence of brain injury which responds to interhemispheric stabilizing okay so let me just say one thing here that again arousal is underlying tone but hyper excitability it's kind of when it tips the point when you are so sensitive you lose your balance very fast and as was mentioned here it can be genetic, just that's the way your mother was, that's the way your family is in general, or it was the result of brain injury then. So it's more the sign of instability. So instability is the next type of dysregulation, and we imply internal loss of stability or control, which can manifest in the form of headaches, mood swings, panic attacks, seizures, as a result of genetic predisposition or brain injury. Instability reflects uh, loss of stability and control, for example, with mood swings. Reactivity reflects overreaction to external triggers. As with reactive anger outbursts, reactivity falls under our category of disinhibition rather than instability of state. In instability, it's important to remember it's not something chronic. It's something that suddenly happens. You're not constantly and chronically in the panic attack. It, it, it just something triggers it and offsets the balance. Same with the seizure. It's important to remember that uh, when we talk about instability, it implies balance, balance of left and right. And luckily with the mind mirror, we do both. We train both hemispheres always and we train temporal lobes, which are the main uh, sites to train for instabilities. So there are quite a lot of things that I personally never associated with this <laughs> and was lucky to learn about it and understand that, oh, finally, I know that my headaches can be a result of this instability. And yes, it is genetically, I'm like my mom, I'm genetically predisposed to this. And then asthma, they are also a sign of instability. And uh, interestingly, autonomic nervous system dysregulation symptoms also belong or fall into the category of instability like dizziness, exercise intolerance, chronic fatigue, low blood pressure. Uh, let's say they uh, cause instability, right? More than the result of it. Even total autonomic system dysregulation, which results in autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, like chronic pains, irritable bowel, Lyme disease or Parkinson's, they all also will 
fall into this category if we are thinking of neurofeedback. I just mentioned on the previous slide that say when you have anger outburst, it doesn't belong to instability, but rather it's not about left and right hemisphere uh, not being balanced. It's more about uh, cortex not being able to perform its function, uh, not activated enough, not mature enough, or just slow for whatever reason. So disinhibition arises from a combination of agitation and lack of prefrontal self-control. Stress, fatigue, or sedatives can increase agitation and thereby increase symptoms. Tics and hyperactivity can increase with both high and low arousal or stress and boredom. This is the situation with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, for example. Excitement can increase hyperactivity and impulsivity. Likewise, sedatives, fatigue, or low blood sugar can decrease prefrontal self-control and release those same behaviors, attention deficit and hyperactive behaviors. Good brain function depends on sufficient top-down inhibitory control from the highest level of our central nervous system. If we lack good inhibitory control genetically or due to injury, illness, or sedating substances, then we become disinhibited with release of immature or primitive behaviors. We target mature control of function by training prefrontal cortex after calming and stabilizing if needed. So I guess you understand now that why very likely people who have probably reward deficits or trauma and have lots of substance abuse, alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, they will often show this disinhibition because obviously their uh, prefrontal cortex function gets undermined along the way severely and that's why you may expect lots of anger outbursts and of course problems with attention and like lots of nervous behavior around them. Now, next one, we are moving to the uh, localized functions. And uh, here it's, it's uh, basically about applying neurofeedback to either developmental trauma or brain injury, uh, where certain uh, brain functions are not working properly. Certain parts of the brain are either underactivated, traumatized. So let's have a closer look at what is responsible for what, because I like it and I think it's, 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 it's once again uh, good to know and good to repeat. So if we look at our brain, uh, front will be responsible for output. It's our executive function. Executive implies uh, that's where we set goals, we plan, we make decisions we uh, control our behavior. So it's top-down attention control, uh, selection and initiation of behavior, inhibitory control of output. So front output, and it's like Northern hemisphere, if you like. Back input or Southern hemisphere is responsible for sensory processing and integration, bottom-up attention to environment, body and spatial knowledge, awareness. So the back of the brain processes input sensory information regarding the outside world and also from inside of our bodies. Uh, training the back of the brain impacts sensory processing and sensory integration. It impacts body awareness and awareness of our body in space. It also impacts spatial attention, attention to our environment in response to sensory input. The front of the brain processes output, moving, speaking, singing, thinking, planning, Training the front of the brain impacts executive function and self-control. We can influence the initiation and sequencing of behaviors. And we can impact the ability to inhibit impulsive, compulsive, immature, and reactive behaviors so that we have time to consider and decide how to act. Frontal training can also impact internally motivated and goal-directed attention. So though we do not do frontal training, <laughs> with the uh, mind mirror, obviously, because we do sides and back of the head. I think when uh, you uh, basically address the core, <laughs> the core of the brain function, it automatically rebalances the rest. So I should say, if uh, we look at the brain as one energy saving system, 
or sometimes I call it, it's just one blanket and you fight for the blanket. If you fix the waist, uh, this balance, it will automatically release more energy to the right functions. Here we talk about right and left hemisphere. So, uh, of course, specific symptoms will guide us where the brain is dysregulated. Uh, right brain function is the more integrative. It looks at the big picture in the moment, in the context of its prior history, and helps us navigate through the world while keeping us safe and well. Left brain function is more analytical and sequential. Left brain sees details and helps us organize our behavior to achieve our goals. We also target the left brain to improve verbal expression as well as reading, writing, and arithmetic. We may think of left and right brain function as text for the left and context for the right. And the interesting thing here is that like there is certain order normally how our functions develop. Here is sensory cognitive. Here we talk about symptoms, but I want to look at this slide as a development path, a development dynamics. And interestingly, you will see that the uh, order that normally in, in clinical field neurofeedback is done starts with the right back and which is responsible for our uh, body body coordination body orientation in space you can see basic number sense visual spatial drawing sensory integration so this and then early language emotional common sense so this part right back think of a child as we develop and we start with getting control over our body we try to get sense of our body, where are our hands, our legs. Then we try to move them and see how we can do it in space. Where is our body? Where is somebody else? Right? How we can get other objects and interact with them. How we can recognize our mother's face. And then as we grow, we get more into emotional level, the next stage. Right? So we learn to recognize uh, basic emotions, again, mama is smiling or not. Uh, we develop common sense, we start our language. And yeah, in the early childhood, that's what kids are doing. They are dancing, right, for body coordination, they are drawing for, again, developing this part of the brain. But then as we continue, uh, we learn to what? We learn to control our emotions. And then we learn to speak, we learn to write, we learn to do mathematical calculations. And then as the last bit, so you kind of see how I'm moving. I'm moving from right back to here, to right front, and I'm moving to left back, and then I'm moving to left front, which is the kind of ultimate uh, development where we are highly organized, where we can set goals and plan and organize our behavior. And basically all other functions will be subordinate to this high function. So I found it absolutely interesting how, how we travel from uh, south uh, hemisphere to the north hemisphere and right to left. Here, I absolutely, again, loved uh, this simplified representation of the brain to understand where what is happening. Back of the brain is responsible for sensory processing. So you can see visual in the back or during here, uh, main sensory processing centers, primary sensory and motor areas, they are called. So what you can see here, you can see this central fissure or central groove that like basically uh, separates your northern and southern hemispheres. And of course, in the just uh, below the border, there will be somatosensory area. And to the north of the border, there will be motor area because that's already execution, that's already output. So again, all input with senses in the back, in the southern hemisphere, all the actions, behavior, uh, motor movement in the front, so in the northern hemisphere. Then adjacent to these main centers uh, or main areas, there will be corresponding modality-specific association sense areas. 
So that's where further processing of sensory information and extraction of more complicated properties of the input occur within each sensory modality. And we have, remember that reading will be say left back, face recognition right back, initiation and sequencing of movements uh, will be in a pre-motor cortex, pre-motor area. The most complex multimodal association areas, so they are not attached to any particular sense, but that's why they're called multimodal. They are involved in the highest level of integration and abstraction of both input and output. They also receive input from limbic areas that provide information on where to direct perception and action in order to survive and achieve our goals. These areas are the most newly evolved parts of our brains and also the last to develop over a lifetime. They are the first to lose function with dementia or normal aging. So what do we see here? Mid temporal, we see inferior parietal, and we see prefrontal. And we have to remember that where we place electrodes makes a huge difference. I guess, uh, it's a rough guess, but uh, we, we kind of might be sitting on the borderline between these two. Anyway, we sit definitely on the multimodal association area with our temporal electrodes. And that always will mean that we are addressing very highly the area with very high information traffic that influences lots of, uh, lots of pathways, neural pathways. That means that will be of a very high influence and impact during uh, the training. So I absolutely love this simplified depiction because it kind of placed everything in order and made it easy to understand and memorize. And here one more important note about limbic system because it kind of sits in the middle, inferior. Uh, you see, so it, it sits uh, in there and here we are pulling the cortex out to show where these parts of the limbic system sit. Cortical and subcortical limbic areas communicate strongly with the multimodal association areas. This allows coordination of drives and emotions plus physiological regulation of visceral state, endocrine balance and immune regulation. We think of limbic function as primarily subcortical, but there are also cortical limbic areas which are largely folded under and out of sight. Pulling back the temporal and frontal lobes exposes limbic cortex extending from the orbitofrontal cortex, this one, through the insula, this bit, to the temporal pole. In discussing input and output functions, it's important to remember that our needs and goals drive all of our brain processing and behavior. We see that we are looking for what, what we are looking for and what we have learned how to recognize. And of course, we act according to our short-term and long-term needs and goals. And uh, when placing electrodes on temporal lobes, we also target limbic system. So that's important for us to remember. Now, the next slide, I thought you might be interested to know what I just mentioned. It's always good to remind or learn. Insula, it's that portion of this eye here of the cerebral cortex folded deep within the lateral sulcus fissure. It's that a groove that separates the temporal lobe from parietal and frontal lobes. So temporal sits like this. Uh, the insula are believed to be involved in consciousness. It's just such a generic and big term, but precisely it has a lot to do with what it feels like to be human. So it plays a role in regulation of emotion, especially social emotion and the body's homeostasis. So many functions of insulin include compassion, empathy, taste, perception, motor control, self-awareness, cognitive functioning, interpersonal experience, and awareness of homeostatic emotions such as hunger, pain, and fatigue. So you can imagine that's a very critical part uh, of our brain. The orbitofrontal cortex is a prefrontal cortex region in the frontal lobes of the brain, which is involved in the cognitive process of decision-making. Focusing one's attention. So, I mean, obviously, orbitofrontal orbiter, it's this 
kind of sockets where your eyes sit. Let's put it as simple as that. And when we talk about uh, orbital frontal, it implies everything related to the vision or your eyes action. So what do we do with eyes? Uh, what do they help us to do uh, with our vision? You know, focusing one's attention, uh, predicting it's uh, literally and uh, kind of uh, indirectly what, what, what it helps us to do. Focusing one's attention, predicting the consequences of one's actions, anticipating events in the environment, impulse control, managing emotional reactions, planning for the future, coordinating and adjusting complex behaviors. I can't do A until B happens. So it's really interesting. I think it's uh, when I was talking about attention as the magic wand. <laughs> so it's uh, really uh, neurophysiological, it's orbitofrontal cortex. It's uh, something which holds the magic wand or your intention or direction, focus of your attention and uh, direct your action in, in, in time and space. So here, once again, the summary of uh, lobes. So we now know that parietal scenes in the South Hemisphere, so it will be all about senses and sensor integration, and namely about body relaxation and awareness, spatial awareness, sensory integration. Temporal, uh, it's, as we know, um, Behind it sits a uh, limbic system. So we'll be talking about emotional regulation, physiological regulation, because we talk about homeostasis there as well. Auditory processing, because uh, the auditory center sits right there and with all the association areas around it. And then object and pattern recognition as well is there. Then occipital, it's in the back of the head a visual process and emotional coming. And visual, it's interesting, again, you will uh, come across articles about research where visual sense is extremely important for trauma and for traumatized people. In Russian, we even have a proverb that fear has big eyes, which implies that you see threat as bigger if you are fearful. Right, so fear makes everything look bigger and more scary than in reality. And it was interesting to find out in some re that some research basically proved that that uh, traumatized people will show abnormal activity in their visual sensory channel, plus this orbital frontal cortex as well. So as if you know what's perceived by this orbital frontal cortex is, is magnified and stored. So basically your eyes will become overly sensitive and reactive to environment and will scan everything for any signal or trigger to relieve the trauma. It's very interesting. Now, prefrontal, impulse control, planning and organization, obsessive and compulsive symptoms, disinhibition, fear and attachment, emotional control. So this is prefrontal cortex. Now, to uh, be even more precise, I highlighted the exact locations and once again uh, marked relevant lobe functions and considerations. So, for example, temporal lobes, the possible locations T3, uh, T5 on the left, T4, T6 on the right. So it will be just behind, above and behind your ears. Left uh, hemisphere uh, locations will be responsible for word recognition, reading, language, memory. Right hemisphere locations will be responsible for object recognition, music, social cues, facial recognition. And then when in clinical world we apply these locations, for anger, rage, dyslexia, long-term memory disorders, close head injury. And I guess it's now obvious why, because we address our emotional center and uh, we address memory, amygdala and hippocampus in limbic system sit just behind. Occipital lobes. So this is the back of the brain, O1 for left hemisphere, O2 uh, right and OC uh, for central Visual learning, reading, parietal, temporal, occipital functions, though it's just occipital, it's closely related to uh, the sides and just above the 
are the parietal centers because it's multimodal kind of association area sits there, which helps to digest and process all the sensory information. And here we talk about learning disorders. And I guess not just that, because as I said, for trauma and visual center is extremely important as well. So very often we know that alpha theta training is used for PTSD or traumatized people to calm them down, to calm their visual center down so it doesn't see the threat as big. So here, just a reminder that uh, you will hear about Broadman areas, numbered areas with the assigned functions. And of course, there are cross references that you can make which Broadman area refers to which uh, neurofeedback location. And here is a link if you ever want to explore more. And here I just picked an example from providers of this BCIA training in Australia. So uh, this is Australian Neurofeedback Institute, and it is based on uh, the basically social service organization, government sponsored, which works with uh, refugees and trauma. And here uh, you can see uh, this uh, kind of topographic maps showing the disorders and issues. And blue will mean something is underactivated. Red will mean something is overactivated. And especially we are looking at this highly activated red areas and typical for uh, traumatized people. That's what you can see. You can see sensory processing issues. So it's the back of the head. And you can see it's closer to the right side. And that right side, right back uh, quadrant will be responsible for, you know, body coming and social cues reading. So that's why, yeah, of course, when you are traumatized, your body will be stressed. You will have a muscle stressed, muscles in tension. You may have chronic pains because of that. And most likely you'll have problems with social interaction, reading social cues, you, again, your eyes will see threat everywhere, even where it doesn't exist. So here, look, same story, emotional processing issues, memory problems, facial recognition issues in reading social cues. Here, poor understanding of social cues. And here on the left, language processing, emotional numbing. Again, part of the same story, because when you're overwhelmed, in one place, it, it kind of steals the energy, I guess. And you may uh, have problems with expressing your uh, emotions fully because you are just stuck uh, everywhere. Why I'm showing this as an example, because you know temporal parietal lobes, yeah, they are very close to what we are looking at. Plus, again, alpha theta is one of the closest uh, analogies for uh, mind mirror awakened mind so low frequency training we are not talking about training beta we're talking about going low and reordering uh, relearning bad habits bad brain habits so here we come to the last part uh, for today learned fears and habits last type of dysregulation and here we have to remember that we have explicit memory so it's something we are conscious of, something that is cortical, so sits in our cortex, something which is related to our later development in life, right? So when we already have acquired our language and thinking and verbal skills, right, and memory. So that's where we can find context with narrative of life. So this memory can be integrated into a story of our life. It's logical and cognitive, and it's about uh, we know that it is about past events because conscious cortical memory uh, gives us this perspective of past and future. And then we have to remember we also have implicit memory, which is unconscious or suppressed. It sits in our subconscious, uh, which is intuitive, subcortical, obviously. So that will be subcortical nuclei. That will be our limbic system. And it relates to our early development and it's context free uh, because at that time we didn't have any perspective yet. We didn't have any perception of future and past. As I mentioned, you know, living in 
limbic system it's a child child little child which has only present moment and it's emotional and somatic yes because we live uh, a lot in our physical and emotional body and um, the, we can't yet explain what we feel, put it into words and gain control of our emotions and feelings. And that's why more likely it will show up as, as a psychosomatic symptom, right? As some allergy or other, other psychosomatic symptom, uh, just because the body wants to communicate and let you know, the external world know that something is wrong, that something is out of order. Uh, these are traumatic memories. They usually sit there and they are pre-verbal. So uh, it's, it's kind of hard to integrate them into life story and into a general kind of uh, tapestry of, of, of your life. Uh, you didn't have the ability to do that yet. So it's always about current experience. So let's understand how we can imply that for neurofeedback and for our uh, mind neural work. So learning occurs throughout the central nervous system. We tend to focus on explicit conscious memories that can be recalled within the storyline of our lives. But this system only comes online when we are a few years old. And older and deeper learning results in implicit memories. This learning shapes how we perceive and respond to the world and how we understand ourselves. Some of these memories are formed in our early pre-verbal life experience, while some may relate to later traumatic experiences. Our subcortical and subconscious brain function is designed to keep us alive and safe. It can learn well in one traumatic event that a situation is life-threatening and to be avoided at all costs. Later attempts to talk ourselves out of this belief and reaction can be ineffective. The combat veteran might know that he is no longer on the battlefield, but his brain remains hypervigilant and hyperreactive. At a sight, a sound or a smell can trigger a flashback of the life-threatening and traumatizing event. So here we talk about serious trauma, but honestly, our, we function like that all the time. The trauma can be much smaller with, you may not even call it trauma, but we still, through our associations, through these smells and sights, and that's why they're so powerful. You know, all sensory stimuli are extremely powerful because they're much faster and they reach our brain and they trigger the situation before the conscious mind knows what's going on and can interfere and explain, hey, hey, it's, it's, it's no longer there. It was in the past that's when alpha theta neurofeedback comes into place so the core there is that implicit and explicit memories interfering with behavioral control and well-being can be addressed in alpha theta training which is one of the closest clinical equivalent equivalent to awakened mind training especially when we talk about removing blocks which is personal transformation when we talk about healing we support a lot arouse a low arousal state in session which means like we come down beta so we can dive in and release the energy to go on deeper levels and kind of swim there with your reduced sensory input so in a clinical environment you would uh, having people in a darkened room lying or half lying in a chair with a comfortable headrest with the eyes closed, sometimes even with heavy blanket on them. Alpha and theta EEG activity promotes synchronous low frequency brainwaves and a disengaged cortex. This allows memories to surface and be processed in a deeply relaxed state. Traumatic memories are stripped off their emotional charge and filed away as memories that can later be consciously recalled without reactivating tr the trauma. So I guess by now, the mechanism behind should be pretty clear to you that um, since they are implicit memories, very often nonverbal, we kind of have to dive in and relieve it, but then come back uh, to our conscious <laughs> cortical brain activity, to our beta and integrate them into our life story and 
find them a place where they belong in the past and discharge of those um, kind of energy charge, emotional charge that the trauma care keeps, you know, relieving itself because limbic system doesn't know any past. It's, it's, it's always in the present. It's always carrying on. So alpha theta training is especially helpful in resolving fears and attachment issues resulting from trauma in early development or in later traumatic situations. Or really, it's also helpful with habits formed through addictive experiences where an addictive substance or behavior gives profound relief from an unrelenting pain or misery. And it is helpful with habitual behaviors such as smoking that might no longer serve a useful purpose but are maintained by long-term associations. I should keep it simple here because really all bad habits, that's the way alpha theta and awakened mind training will address. You have bad habit of doing lots of unnecessary moves or, <laughs> uh, or just in general, bad habit of overthinking or being stuck. Uh, all bad habits are good, you know, and uh, are, can be reprogrammed and are good for uh, this type of neurofeedback, low frequency neurofeedback. And here we are looking at what we want from peak performance neurofeedback. But I will uh, explain the mechanism next time because I, I, I come across a beautiful explanation of uh, neurons pooling and how it comes together. And basically the very, very essence of peak performance explain that uh, I, I won't do today, but in general, let's remind ourselves that we want the brain to be in balance and it, we want it to be uh, flexible and we want uh, certain functions to be stable, right? So uh, traveling uh, from here to there, so it will be counterclockwise from the bottom right quadrant, we'll um, check uh, if... Uh, we need physical coming if we need, address, need to address body needs, body coordination, uh, body uh, sensation of itself or body sensation in space. For sportsmen, you know, that may be important. Um, then, uh, of course, we need to make sure that right front uh, quadrant knows what to do as well so that our emotions are under control. Then uh, we, if we are talking about, I don't know, musicians or whoever might require fine motor skills and good timing and reading calculation, of course, this is the left back quadrant that needs to be uh, active and well, well trained. Then uh, we need, of course, mental coming, impulse control, planning organization and obsessive compulsive symptoms, which means basically we are stuck and we uh, do not see other opportunities. We, we, and energy is not flowing and perspective is unavailable. So, yeah, we need all of it to kind of predict our actions and the results of our actions and plan them best. And, of course, left-right is very important for physiological and emotional stability. And once again, uh, I just mentioned when we were talking about arousal and I was going through all the brain waves and what's the norm is, uh, if you remember, uh, the most common uh, training that I mentioned is sensory motor rhythm. And sensory motor, if you remember again, it's just on the border around this central fissure or the fissure separating the borderline between north and south hemisphere. And I can see that that to be the main, one of the main highways in your brain, one of the main, and the vertex will be one of the main crossroads with so many uh, neural pathways leading there. The, the most common really training for, I mean, neurofeedback started with epilepsy, which is supposed to be uh, trained on sensory motor strip because, you know, you don't want body to do strange, wasteful moves out of the blue because of some sensory integration problems. So yes, it's sensory motor strip. And you say for peak performance, uh, I was told there was a guy who placed, he was called Mr. CZ. So he was placing the electrode right on the top, very center of the brain. And he had very good success with whatever he was, not just peak performance, with whatever he was doing with neurofeedback. He has 75% of success. 
So I found it amazing and like for myself kind of made a note, okay, this is the central crossroads. <laughs> That's the way to go. But uh, I mean, let's remember that again with my mirror, we have, we don't go there centrally, but we go temporally, we go here. And these locations are very, very efficient. So for you to explore more, if you like, this will be the main three books. Of course, the information sources, and there's so much information available these days. But the main guidance for anatomy and neurophysiology was taken from the Orthmus protocol guide. And though it's for infralow frequency neurofeedback, I found the approach maybe simplified, maybe mechanistical, very good and just simple and good enough to make an idea and memorize it, keep it in mind. So Technical Foundations of Neurofeedback is another good book. If you really want to understand the electricity and all the mechanics and uh, mathematics behind a great book, which emphasizes all the misunderstandings and simplifications that we often come across. I'll be talking about peak performance next time from as explained in this book. Plus, Functional Neuromarkers for Psychiatry sounds a yeah, difficult title by a Russian scientist, by the way, Yuri Kropotov. So he was the one who devoted his time mainly uh, to building databases of the uh, normal and uh, you know, abnormal populations and their, their brainwaves. And he is the one who does uh, event-related potential, so highly localized he could measure highly localized responses of where and how which frequency will be triggered and how our main uh, functions or systems will operate, sensory system or executive system or motor system, and which parts of the brain in which order will be triggered. It's literally, you can just, oh, I saw it. Oh, I, my brain recognized this. Oh, my brain was ready to press the button and with milliseconds time and showing uh, depolarization of polarization, negative, positive charge. <laughs> In a certain location, he was able to describe this. So this is a beautiful book, which probably is the only one where I could find this summary of where the brains come from, uh, their location, their geography in the brain, and what they do, because uh, this is a recent uh, publication, and that means lots of articles will be summarized, they'll mention there. Otherwise, the field is like an ocean where you can drown with the level of details. So here is a checklist for you. And you can watch again, and I'll share this presentation with you so you can keep it for yourself, or redo it at home. But I hope by now you know what's neuron, what's nerve, what's three brain theory. Uh, you know what's, I may suggest you do this as a home task. You find a keyword, a metaphor for the function of cortex, thalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, uh, singular gyrus, insular brainstem, and limbic system in general. I may start my next part with this question, and it would be interesting to hear what you would come up with. And then I'm sure now you know what's the difference between left, right, and back front of the head. And what are uh, the temporal and occipital lobes responsible for? And why T3, T4, temporal lobes locations, is the most efficient electrodes locations, location, uh, maybe besides this CZ central vertex, the top of the head, the center of the old crossroads. And the my mirror related questions here that I want you to remember and check yourself. I want you to remember how my mirror is different from other EEG devices and the ways we work. Uh, where do we uh, place our electrodes? I guess it was mentioned multiple times throughout the presentation, so you should remember by now. What types of dysregulation might be addressed with the awakened mind? And what are the no-nos? That's a good question. So I think this question three as well will address in the beginning of next part. And uh, of course, now I bet you know what are the closest clinical analogies for the awakened mind training work. I mean, we don't exist in vacuum. There is yeah, other things happening. 
but as I mentioned, they happen for really serious mental disorders and serious problems, so they should be performed by qualified practitioners. But Mind Mio has to do a lot <clears throat> there as well and offers a lot in, the, in, in a more kind of user-friendly, I should say, way to interpret uh, and navigate and master and train yourself. And of course, what are they based on? Maybe, yeah, not maybe, definitely we will talk about peak performance training in uh, more detail on neuronal level. So for next time, my plan is to cover more of electrical issues because we are talking about electricity. I don't want to go too much into detail because, as I said, this is the field where you can easily ground with lots of dry information and you can dig uh, in um, up. It's unlimited, really. So we want to know what's the source of EEG signal, what exactly is happening. First, we need to understand where these brain wave categories come from, how we split them into frequencies and how we locate uh, their origin and how we interpret their function because they're very, very complex. It's not black and white. I wish to just draw a simple table, but we'll try. We'll try to approximate. So I hope you enjoyed the program. I know there is overabundance of information, but I hope you found it helpful and will join me next time. So if you have any questions for now, you're welcome. Or we'll say goodbye and meet each other next Saturday, same time. Thank Fantastic, you. Oksana. Lots of food for thought. Yep. I mean, I tried to keep it simple as much as I could. I know it's complex, but if you do it like one, two, three, four, <laughs> and then a little bit of detail, just the basic ones that is relevant to us, and maybe something that you want to know, at least to share show that you heard of if somebody asks you, you know, about other clinical, about QEG, about, you need to know. <laughs> it's beautifully and, organized and everybody is um, sending comments in the chat. Wonderful, beautiful, uh, beautifully organized. Thank you. And very nicely done. Congratulations. So, yeah, looking forward to part two next week, same time, same space, 3 p.m. Uh, New York time, Eastern Standard Time. And um, I can see that, you know, once I don't think you're going to have to edit a single thing in here because it was perfect as it was. But once it's available, I can see that we're going to be going through this and studying it and probably have a lot of great questions by the end of part two. You're very welcome. I encourage you to, um, that was my approach. You know, I was just desperately trying to look at it as a brain town or like compare with hemispheres or <laughs> try to Beautiful. find metaphors because it's the only way for me to remember because just dry information that the way it is presented and another important key to me personally, again, because I like structure, I like order, I like logic. So for me, it means I need to know what's coming from where, what our interrelationships are. And if I understand these interrelationships, that will kind of link all this information together and will make it easier for me to understand. And I, yeah, I'm struggling when just somebody just names it and I can't like, wh where, where from, where to, why, what for, and all the key questions in life. So I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And yes, do your home task, repeat. Uh, try to make a story of what's going on and come up with you know, your examples, your metaphors. Okay, thank if anybody you, has to compliment you, next time, you're welcome. Correct me if you found mistakes. If you know more because you're a physical doctor, <laughs> you live with this knowledge every day, not like me, psychologist who studied it once and then twice and then kind of it's... <laughs> I don't use it in everyday life. So um, you're welcome. All righty. Thank you again. Thanks for your attention.